It's 10 o'clock, so let's get started. Um, <coughs> last week, I talked about uh, voluntary measures. I talked about the Coase theorem, which we also did yesterday. Uh, and I talked about uh, command and control, or direct regulation. Uh, today, I'm going to talk about uh, market-based instruments for uh, environmental policy. Specifically, I'm going to talk about taxes subsidies and tradable permits. Uh, I think I'm going to skip the comparison uh, at the end uh, and move to the, um, the lecture that I skipped to do at least part of the complications with instruments there, the most important part that you, I think, need to know. Um, <coughs> this is the last week before spring break. Um, spring break is three weeks. Now two, uh, as some of you uh, thought, uh, the essay is due in week nine on the first day, uh, which makes it the 18th uh, of April, and it should be up on Canvas as a proper assignment. Uh, hopefully late today, uh, but definitely later uh, this week. But nothing has changed with regard to the contents, if that what was had, uh, if that had you worried. Um, <laughs> so. Uh, to start off uh, today, I'm going to begin with uh, Texas, uh, and I'm also going to talk uh, a bit about uh, plastic bag uh, levies. Uh, so what is uh, a tax, or an environmental tax, that you pay a charge, or a levy, or a penalty, or a fee for every unit of the offending substance consumed, produced, or emitted? Uh, what we call this thing is partly a legal matter, and partly a political matter. In some jurisdictions, in some polities, the word tax uh, is forbidden, and you would use a different word in other parts of the world. You can speak about taxes without any political uh, repercussions. <coughs> but essentially, you pay for, hopefully, your emissions, because that is what offends. Uh, but sometimes you can't tax emissions, so you have to tax production or consumption uh, instead. Uh, so how does this work? Here we have uh, a cost-benefit uh, diagram that we've seen already. Uh, on the horizontal axis we have emissions, on the vertical axis we have marginal gains. Uh, and then the brown curve here is the marginal private gains from emissions. <coughs> and that must stop at a certain point uh, because we don't emit uh, infinite amounts, we don't consume infinite amounts. Uh, if uh, we're talking about uh, emissions related to energy use, then at a certain point you stop charging your phone because the battery is full. At a certain point you stop heating your home uh, because it's warm enough and heating it further will cost money. Uh, so at a certain point you stop using more energy. Uh, and that is that point Q uh, prime. Now the private decision ignores uh, the environmental externalities. And the environmental externalities here at the margin are given by uh, this green curve here. Uh, those are the marginal social losses from the emissions. Uh, and then we said that the regulator, if uh, C optimizes social welfare, uh, would set emissions equal to the amount Q star, which, which is where the marginal cost equal the marginal benefits. So this is the point of the social optimum. Um, now, Q, uh, the, the, the brown curve is the unregulated uh, equilibrium. Now what happens if we impose a tax on emissions? Well, <coughs> then your private gains from uh, the emitting activity fall. Oh, sorry, uh, to uh, what I believe is orange. Um, and because it used to be free to emit, now you have to pay a tax on your emissions, therefore it is costlier, therefore your private gains at the margin have fallen, and therefore you would do less. So this is what an environmental tax would do to emissions. It simply makes it more expensive and therefore less attractive to emit. Uh, it's important to realize that environmental tax is not a PIGU tax, but a PIGU tax is an environmental tax. Um, 
if we put the tax exactly at the amount of the marginal social cost, then the tax reduces emissions not from Q prime to Q double prime, but to Q star. And this particular environmental tax we call the Pigou tax. It's the Pigou tax that exactly restores the social optimum. Not just reduces emissions, but reduces emissions to the socially optimal amount of emissions. Uh, <coughs> now typically we don't know where that green curve is. Uh, so typically what we do is we impose a tax on emissions. And we move emissions in the right directions, we re in the right direction we reduce them and we hope that it gets somewhere to the social optimum but of course we do not know for sure and sometimes not even approximately where that green curve lies, right? <coughs> so that is uh, an environmental tax uh, and that is um, really as uh, simple as it is, this is all there is uh, to it. Um, taxes have been used uh, <coughs> And the uh, in uh, the real world, the example I'm going to talk about um, is the plastic bag levy that was introduced in Ireland in the year 2002. Uh, this has been dubbed the most popular tax in Europe. Um, but when it was introduced, it was actually done against the will of the Irish people. Um, what you're looking at here in table one is... Uh, contingent valuation study where the people in Ireland were asked are you willing to pay for your plastic bags so that plastic use uh, would go down and plastic waste would go down um, <coughs> 40 percent answered and uh, no uh, and then the majority said well maybe a few pennies uh, and the tax that was introduced was actually more than a few pennies, it was actually uh, 15 uh, euro cents. Between the introduction of the tax and the survey, the euro was introduced, right? That is why we switched uh, currency. Uh, <coughs> but the people uh, did not like it uh, at all. The reason that it was introduced um, was uh, plain politics. Um, the Minister for the Environment, this was a time of austerity in Ireland, uh, the Minister for, Envi for the Environment could not convince the Treasurer or the Minister of Finance, as it's called in Ireland, uh, to increase his budget. So what he did was introduce this particular levy and the revenue flows straight into the Ministry for the Environment rather than into the Treasury. Uh, so it's not quite a tax, it's a levy for a particular purpose and that means that the money flows to a different part of the government uh, and that is the reason why the minister, who was not at all green, uh, decided to do this because this essentially increased his power in government, essentially increased his budget uh, to do uh, nice things. Uh, so uh, it was introduced um, and um, I mean, uh, it was a small levy, 15 uh, euro cents per bag. Um, the annual revenue was only uh, 13 million <coughs> euros. The fixed cost of introducing this tax, because you needed to adjust computer <laughs> systems and that sort of stuff, uh, was 1.2 million. Uh, there was an awareness campaign of uh, 360. And then you need to hire a few uh, civil servants to keep an eye on it uh, at an annual cost of 350,000. Uh, so from the government's perspective, this was a good thing, right? You paid a little bit of money and you actually got a lot of money into the government coffers, specifically into the Ministry for the Environment. Uh, <coughs> the costs were so low, essentially because the payment systems were already in place. Whenever you go to the supermarket, you already pay VAT, you already pay excises on the cigarettes you should not buy, and the alcohol uh, that you buy, and so on and so forth. Um, just adding an excise on a plastic bag is another line of code. This is uh, easily uh, done. Uh, and the revenue was quite um, 
quite substantial compared <coughs> to the cost. Of course, it's not a big sum of money. Um, the reason that it's not uh, such a big uh, sum of money is because actually people stopped or uh, started using uh, much less plastics than they used to. They switched en masse to paper bags uh, at the supermarket checkout. Um, as a result, the areas that, um, that saw no plastic litter in the landscape uh, increased by 21%. Uh, areas with very little litter increased by 56%. So this was unambiguously good for the environment. Uh, the amount of plastic that ended up in uh, people's uh, bins and therefore eventually into uh, incinerators or landfill uh, fell from 5%. It used to be that the contents of household bins was 5% plastic bags. That fell to uh, a fifth of a percent. Um, retailers um, were happy uh, because to them it was actually, I mean, switching from plastic to paper bags was not a, not a big deal. Um, and uh, <coughs> it's actually a bit cheaper to use paper bags rather than uh, plastic bags, so they were happy to. And the public, although initially resistant to this, recall the willingness to pay table that I showed you, they were not prepared to pay for this, actually after the fact uh, turned out uh, to be uh, pretty happy. So this was really resistance to a change in the status quo rather than people that really thought it through. Is it such a big deal to use a paper bag rather than a plastic bag? Um, no, it was not. People came out uh, pretty happy. Uh, and that is why this is dubbed the most uh, popular tax in the world. Uh, and a lot of countries followed the Irish example, which is a bit unfortunate because actually Denmark did this first, but Ireland gets all the credit. Um, and uh, similar taxes have been, or levies, or whatever you want to call them, have been introduced uh, around uh, the world. Uh, Wales was the first country in the United Kingdom uh, to do this in 2010. Also there, plastic bag use fell quite uh, substantially uh, by 71% um, for single-use bags. Uh, Multi-use bags uh, fell uh, less. Uh, substantially only 60% or so. Um, the <coughs> vehicle here was a little bit different um, because instead of the money flowing to the government, the money flows to charities uh, in Wales. And we talked a little bit about it in the seminar that in the very beginning, we know that that money really went to charities, but now we sort of have lost interest and lost track. Um, <coughs> But a substantial sums of money, this is Wales alone, uh, around 20 million pounds was donated to charities uh, between 2011 and 2014. So also here uh, you see, and Wales is a pretty small uh, part of the country, right? Um, Wales uh, set the example in the United Kingdom, Scotland followed in 2014 and England uh, followed in 2015. And if you follow this literature, it's actually more and more countries are doing this with similar results. So you can introduce this tax, not too much public resistance with positive effects for the environment uh, and positive effects for the exchequer or for charities, right? <laughs> so this uh, works. Much more popular, however, for reasons that will become apparent, uh, <laughs> are environmental subsidies. Um, and uh, with a tax you pay to emit, with a subsidy you get paid not to emit. It's essentially um, <coughs> the idea, right? And again, it can be on reducing your emissions, it can be on uh, changing your production, it can be on the volume of production, uh, it can also be on the composition or volume of consumption that the subsidy uh, lies. Um, <coughs> So, first question, are taxes and subsidies different in the short run? Um, well, I showed you uh, this diagram. Uh, this tells you what does an environmental tax do to your emissions if you're fully rational. You pay more, uh, more tax if you increase your emissions. If you reduce your emissions, you pay less tax. So reducing emissions 
brings financial gain to you because you reduce your tax burden, right? So this is what a tax does to emissions. Now let's look at subsidies. Um, well, if you reduce your emissions, you get more subsidy. So that is a financial gain to you. If you increase your emissions, you forego part of the subsidy that you were initially entitled to. So that's a financial loss to you. And you may have noticed <laughs> that these two graphs are identical, except for the words. In the short run, taxes and subsidies are, have the same effect, and that is because subsidies have a double negative. With a, under a tax, if you increase your e emissions, you pay more. With a subsidy, if you increase your emissions, you forego a subsidy. A subsidy is a negative tax. Forgo is another negative, so we have a double negative, and that is why subsidies and taxes are the same, the same effect at the margin and therefore in the short run. Clear? Um, <coughs> I'll show later that if we have a uniform tax or a uniform subsidy, they were automatically cost effective. I'll make that more precise uh, in a minute. Uh, but first, we're going to look at the effects in the long run. Uh, so let's go back to uh, our cost-benefit uh, diagram, uh, or rather just the cost uh, diagram. Previously, I showed uh, the marginal cost curve, private, uh, the marginal private gains curve. Uh, and I said, well, your rational amount of emissions is where your marginal private gains equal zero. That, of course, corresponds to the point where the total private gains uh, are maximum, right? And the total gains curve goes uh, flat. Um, now, this curve is the marginal. What happens to the average? Uh, that looks uh, something like this, right? Um, and you wonder why are you showing me the average? We hardly ever consider uh, the average. Well, the average doesn't matter in the short run, but it does matter in the long run because the average private gains are related to the return on your investment. Um, now, what happens if we introduce a tax to the average private gains? They fall. Because now for everything you do, you have to hand money to the government. Um, whereas with a subsidy, for everything you do, you actually get a subsidy from the government. So with a tax, the average gains fall, because you're, for, you're giving money to the government. With a subsidy, your average gains rise because you're getting paid by the government related to your activity. Um, and that means that the returns to investment have changed. If you put a tax on emissions, the returns to investment in the polluting activity have fallen and therefore if you're a smart investor you would put your money elsewhere whereas with subsidies the return to investment have increased and therefore if you're a smart investor you're going to put more money into the offending uh, activity uh, <coughs> uh, and that means that taxes and subsidies have um, the opposite effect in the long run. Taxes reduce the size of the polluting sector, subsidies increase the size of the polluting sector. So in the short run, taxes and subsidies are the same. In the long run, subsidies actually increase emissions relative to what taxes would have done and relative to what would have been the situation without any environmental policy. Um, so taxes and subsidies are different in the long run. <coughs> Taxes and subsidies also have different uh, budgetary uh, implications. Obviously, a tax 
money flows to the government, the subsidy money flows out of the government, um, which may be an important uh, consideration. Um, <coughs> and that immediately means that the politics are different too. So if we are talking about a relatively small subsidy that goes to a particular uh, industry or a particular part of industry, then you can expect strong lobbying for this from those people who benefit because they are few, it's a targeted subsidy. The cost of that subsidy is typically paid out of general taxation so we all pay a little bit more in tax or get a little bit less in public goods otherwise. But the pain of that is very diffuse. So there is very little lobbying against this, but there's strong lobbying for the subsidy, right? So politically, subsidies are very clever. Right? That is why they are uh, so very popular. Whereas if you want to introduce a tax, you immediately have the people who are the target of the tax, of the proposed tax, you have squealing uh, and lobbying against this. Whereas again, the benefit of this, say a very small increase in the budget of the NHS or a sm very small increase in the budget uh, for higher education, Again, the benefits of this are diffuse and the people uh, who are positively affected by this may not notice, definitely do not have a strong incentive to lobby for this, right? Um, so for these reasons, subsidies are politically much, much easier to introduce than taxes. Uh, it's entirely wrong, uh, but that is how the system uh, works. Um, and obviously there's distributional uh, effects as well. Uh, if we believe that most environmental pollution comes from necessary goods and services, and that is roughly true, a lot of environmental <coughs> stuff, a lot of environmentally bad stuff comes out of energy use, comes out of uh, uh, food production, <coughs> agriculture. Um, these are necessary goods. So if you introduce a tax, you're going to increase the price of necessary goods that necessarily falls more heavily on poorer households because they pay a greater share of their income towards the consumption of necessary goods than the richer house households. Um, so a tax necessarily hurts the poor more than the rich. Uh, and a subsidy then obviously works the opposite direction. The subsidy is often primarily beneficial to the poorer parts of society. So this is another reason why sub subsidies may be more politically palatable than taxes. Um, this is not what uh, theory says politicians should do, uh, but it's also what theory tells you politicians would like to do, right? Because this is the way to stay popular and get re-elected. Um, <clears throat> so that is taxes uh, and subsidies. Uh, let's move to uh, tradable uh, permits. And the example that I'm going to talk about are uh, sulfur uh, permits. Um, <coughs> so how do tradable permits work? Uh, come in. Um, it starts with the government setting an overall cap on emissions say 100 million tons of sulfur are to be uh, emitted uh, this year. Uh, the cap should be on emissions because that is what we're worried about, but it can also be on production, it can also be on consumption. Um, then this overall cap, 100 million tons of sulfur per year, um, is then split into say 100 million permits for the emission of one ton uh, of sulfur, uh, and then those permits are allocated to the emitters of sulfur uh, and that is their annual cap on their emissions. So far this is command and control, right? We just set a target for every company in the country. Um, but then the market uh, kicks in 
because if a producer has too many permits, it can sell them to producers that have too few permits relative to their production plans, right? Um, and that is uh, <coughs> how this works. And the effect uh, is uh, something as uh, follows. On the uh, horizontal axis, we have emission reduction uh, rather than emissions. On the, uh, that's why the curve is uh, sloped the other way. Uh, on the uh, vertical axis, we have the marginal cost of emission reduction. For simplicity, we have two firms, firm one and firm two, very original names. One is in green and the other is in red. This, of course, is bad for those who are colorblind. Sorry about that. Um, and firm one, it is expensive to cut emissions at the margin. Uh, its uh, marginal cost curve is steeper than that of firm two, for whom it is cheaper to reduce emissions. Um, so if they both get allocated the same amount of uh, the same obligation to reduce emissions, uh, Q1 is Q2, and uh, then obviously at the margin, firm one would pay more than firm two, uh, and you see the difference here. And we now immediately violate uh, the Baumol condition, right? Recall last week, the condition for cost effectiveness of emission reduction is that everybody pays the same at the margin, which is clearly not the case. Firm one pays P1, firm two pays P2, and P1 is higher than P2. <coughs> so now what can they do? So this is the initial allocation, but they are allowed to trade. So uh, firm two, for whom it is more, uh, for whom it is cheaper to reduce emissions, can say to firm one, I'm gonna cut my emissions by a little bit more in return, you can cut your emissions by a little bit less, but I want to see money for this uh, transaction, right? Um, so firm two moves to the right, works harder. Firm one moves to the left, it works less hard. Uh, and there is a mutually advantageous deal uh, to be had between the two until the point where the price, the marginal cost of emission reduction is equal for the two. Um, and the distance between this line and this line is the same as the distance between this line and this line, right? Firm two moves as much to the right as firm one moves to the left. Um, uh, and at this point, firm one is prepared to pay P1 to firm two to cut its emissions further. But firm two says, well, but actually I want P2 or more than that, right? So you can't move beyond this point because here its willingness to pay is lower, the willingness to pay of firm one is lower than the willingness to accept compensation of firm two, right? So this is the point where the transaction stops uh, and at that point the prices are equal between the two firms. So this is how tradable permits work. If you have two firms, <coughs> Obviously, we would have uh, many, many uh, more. <coughs> um, <coughs> so, if the permit market is uh, perfect, that is, everybody faces the same price, then we automatically meet uh, the Baumol conditions, right? Um, I'll get to Weizmann. Uh, in a minute, let's first look at uh, the first, not true, uh, look at the first successful um, and highly visible market for tradable uh, permits. Um, there were actually a few permit markets that were also successful but did not, did not really attract the same sort of attention. Um, so, <coughs> Nixon, uh, of all people, introduced the Clean Air Act way back uh, when, um, and then in 1990, uh, which is still way before you were born, right? Uh, the Clean Air Act that was introduced by Nixon 
uh, was amended uh, and in title four of those amendments um, what happened was that they introduced a market for sulfur permits um, <coughs> and uh, initially it was fairly modest it only covered 263 uh, power generators in the United States I should have added uh, and that covered only a modest say one-fifth uh, of uh, the market this was after it turned out that the whole thing worked they extended it and extended it and extended it um, this is not uh, cheap uh, because in order to monitor how much sulfur comes out of your smokestack you need to include a device uh, and such a device is expensive and takes energy and costs around 124,000 per unit per year so this is not something that you would want at the back of your car right this is really something that you can do for large point sources but not for small diffuse uh, sources <coughs> um, and uh, these 263 units can freely trade uh, their permits so they get in a certain amount of well, they don't get uh, they start an initial allocation of permits and then they can sell or think well I have too many I'm gonna sell them or I have too few I'm gonna buy some on the market uh, that is all possible uh, what they can also do is say well I'm gonna save my permits for next year or for the year after you cannot borrow from the future because of enforcement rules uh, or, or limits on enforcement but you can bank to the future so time flows in one uh, direction <coughs> Um, this was a, a fairly uh, successful uh, program in uh, the top line that you see here uh, are the EPA's projections of what um, emissions would be without uh, the policy then this line here are the emission plans this was the announced targets of the policy uh, and then what you see here was the actual emissions it turned out that it was simply uh, a lot cheaper a lot easier to cut sulfur emissions than the EPA the Environmental Protection Agency believed there was uh, an acceleration of the policy beyond everybody's expectation essentially um, <coughs> trade was uh, fairly uh, lively uh, the uh, this is this is old stuff so people did not really have access to proper graphing technology uh, so the very thick line uh, that you see here is the initial allocation so this is what would have happened without trade uh, and then the bars that you see is what happened with trade and you see that basically every company uh, and that is uh, what you see on the horizontal uh, axis basically every country deviated from its initial allocation um, that is everybody basically either sold or bought permits very few companies uh, were uh, in a f uh, uh, were out of the market for opted out of the market right uh, so that was uh, very lively and uh, the prices were also um, very different from what people expected uh, so what you see here were the predicted prices before the market started and then these are the actual prices once the market uh, kicked in um, and what you see is that well, people expected the price of sulfur permits to be in the range of 250 to 300 uh, dollars per ton of sulfur but actually they started off around 175 and quickly fell to below 100 it turned out that it was much cheaper to reduce emissions of sulfur than people expected it was a bit unclear whether this was lobbying efforts that said it's going to be expensive but also actually independent academics also predicted it's going to be expensive you don't really know how to do it um, um, so the first lesson from this was that the costs were actually much lower than expected and uh, this may be because of technology pessimism uh, in 
the models or perhaps a little bit of uh, lobbying uh, effort on behalf of industry. Another interesting thing uh, happened um, and that is what you see here. <laughs> um, <coughs> so the permits were actually not allocated for free but they were auctioned by the EPA. So if you wanted to run uh, a power plant and you wanted to emit sulfur uh, then you needed to buy permits to do so at auction. Um, <coughs> this is uh, the auction in 1993, this is 1994, this is 1995. This is the demand curve, this is the supply curve, demand curve, supply curve, demand curve, demand curve, supply curve. So in the first year what you actually see is a fairly widespread in demand. People did not really know how much to pay for these permits. Uh, and also a fairly widespread in the supply. People did not really know how much to ask for uh, this. Then actually that spread became less in the second year. And what you see in the third year is that the, the, the <coughs> demand curve goes flat and the supply curves curve goes vertical, which means that everybody knew in advance what the price would be, right? Nobody made any silly bids for uh, permits, uh, nobody tried to sell at silly prices. The market had found all the necessary information for trade within two years. In the beginning people were very uncertain about what uh, was going to happen. After two years, everybody knew what the market was doing, right? <coughs> um, so uh, another thing that wasn't uh, on uh, the graph is that because this uncertainty disappeared, all those people who were selling what they called information also very quickly disappeared out of the market. So in the beginning there were a lot of consultants going around making tons of money explaining to companies how this whole thing worked and what the price would be and how they should behave and how much they should bid and so on and so forth and they make good money out of this. Uh, you saw a lot of that activity in the year before the market started and in the first year of the market but by the third year those people were gone. Uh, similarly uh, brokers the sort of like who sit in between the buyer and the seller also in the beginning charged fairly uh, fat premiums uh, but after two years also either they were completely cut out of the market or their margins were razor thin. So the market really quickly found its own feet. Um, <coughs> now these um, two uh, aspects together that the costs were much lower that emissions came down faster than anybody had hoped uh, and that the market very quickly found its feet uh, to a large extent explains the popularity of uh, tradable permits around the world, right? Uh, Policy makers uh, in other countries are looked at what happened with sulfur in the United States and said we can do this, much like a lot of com countries looked at Ireland and said, well, what you're doing with your plastic bags, we can do as well. Um, so too, a lot of companies, countries looked around and said, we can do tradable permits as well. <coughs> and tradable permits have now been introduced for all sorts of other things, <coughs> most importantly, perhaps, uh, for carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases um, in many countries in the world. Um, <coughs> so I promised to make a cost effectiveness more precise, right? Um, and I haven't uh, done so yet. Uh, this we talked about uh, last week. If we assume a cost function for company N uh, that looks like this, a quadratic uh, function, beta M uh, plus half times gamma M squared, and we want to minimize the total cost of emission reduction by summing over the cost of all polluters subject to an emission reduction constraint that the total emission reduction um, must be equal than or greater than the national target M without a subscript. 
Um, <clears throat> this is cost effectiveness, right? We meet the target at the lowest possible cost. Um, if you want to solve this, you form the Lagrangian. So you take the objective function and then you rewrite the constraint and put a, a shadow price in front, uh, a lambda or a Lagrange uh, multiplier. Then the first order condition is that the first partial derivative of the Lagrangian to the things that we are deciding on, how much emissions to reduce in company, how much emissions M to reduce in company N, um, <coughs> then uh, that looks as follows, that is why the function is like this. Um, and what we have is that the marginal cost of emission reduction for company N is equal to the shadow price of the constraint, lambda. And somebody asked me, what does this upside down A means? This means for all N, as somebody told you in your calculus. Um, <coughs> so the first order condition or the Baumol condition for cost effectiveness is that the marginal cost is equal to all producers. Um, <coughs> now, this is the case generally. Now let's look at what happens if we introduce a tax, right? So if we introduce a tax, um, then you have to add this particular term to your cost function. And recall that M is emission reduction. So the more you cut your emissions, the less tax you pay. And that is why we have a minus uh, T M rather than a plus T. If you cut your emissions, you pay less tax, right? So your costs uh, fall. Uh, now this is an unconstrained optimization. Uh, we want to minimize for every company uh, the costs of production. So we take the first partial derivative of our cost, DC, to the thing that we decide, that is M sub N. Um, that is beta plus 2 times a half, that's 1, a gamma uh, m. So again, uh, linear minus t must equal 0. So the marginal cost of emission reduction are equal to our tax t. And this is again true for all companies, for all polluters n. So provided that everybody pays the same tax at the margin, we automatically get the cost effectiveness um, that uh, <coughs> Beaumont would like to see, right? If the tax is uniform, typically it is hard to differentiate uh, taxes. Now, what happens if we introduce uh, a subsidy? Well, for every unit of emissions you reduce more, you get a payment, S, and as a result your costs fall. Right? So we again have to subtract uh, a sum minus S M N. <coughs> then you optimize, right? What is the difference between uh, this equation and this equation? Well, the T has become an S. Uh, so now uh, we have that the marginal cost of emission reduction for all firms is equal to the subsidy S. So provided that every polluter gets the same subsidy for emission reduction, and it's actually easier to differentiate uh, subsidies than it is to differentiate taxes, um, you automatically end up, you automatically satisfy the Baumol condition, you have a cost effective solution. Um, <coughs> now, let's do tradable permits. What happens to the cost function? Now, if you cut your emissions further, that is, if you increase your M, one of two things can happen. Either you have to pay, uh, you have to buy fewer permits, and therefore your costs fall by the amount M times the price of those permits, P. That is if you're a net buyer of permits. If you're a net seller of permits, if you cut your in-house emissions further, you have 
more permits to sell, therefore your revenue increases and therefore your costs fall, right? So regardless of whether you're a buyer or a seller, you have to subtract minus P times M sub N. Now, if we take this equation, and you want to minimize it, we write down the first order conditions, what has changed, the marginal cost of emission reduction must now be equal to P rather than to T. But provided that everybody is in the same market and paying the same for their permits, or getting the same for the permits that they sell, we automatically satisfy Bohm mol, we get into a cost-effective solution, right? <coughs> Taxes, subsidies, tradable permits, provided that the tax and the subsidy are uniform and the market is perfect, um, get you to a cost-effective uh, solution, right? Okay, <laughs> I write down uh, the things that I just uh, told you. <coughs> So in the short run, um, taxes and subsidies are the same. Taxes and tradable permits are also the same, right? Um, taxes and tradable permits are very similar. Both reduce emissions. Both equate abatement cost at the margin. Um, taxes and tradable permits are also very similar. Uh, be well, can be very similar. Uh, a tax brings money to the government. Tradable permits, it depends on how you allocate your permits. So the example that I just gave for the sulfur permits, they were auctioned. So the money flows to the Environmental Protection Agency who are selling the permits, flows to the government, right? Um, that is one way of allocating um, <coughs> Uh, tradable permits initially. That is how uh, about half of the uh, permits in the UK ETS for greenhouse gases are auctioned, so the money flows to the government. Um, the other half uh, of permits in the UK ETS is what some people call grandfathered, uh, but it's better called grandparented. Um, and that is a popular way of allocating emissions. Essentially what you do is you say, well, we have a total allowance of 100 million tons of sulfur, but we're not going to auction them. We're going to give those 100 million tons away for free. And we're going to give it to the companies in proportion to their emissions, say, in the year 2022. So we look at emissions of two years ago where we have a reasonable record uh, and we said well total emissions have to fall by 10% and therefore the initial allocation is that every company has to cut its emissions by 10% and that is how we're going to allocate the, permissions, uh, the permits and we're going to give them away for free. <coughs> if you do that then taxes and tradable permits are obviously not equivalent in budgetary perspective. Uh, the politics is also very different actually giving away things for free is politically much easier than imposing a new tax, right? Because then you're only imposing sort of the administrative costs and the cost of trading and the cost of monitoring, uh, but you're not imposing any additional costs on companies and therefore they won't squeal uh, as hard when you propose to do this. Um, <coughs> but um, the disadvantage of giving away permits for free is, well, is essentially a capital subsidy and it's essentially a capital subsidy for the polluters, right? <laughs> You're essentially giving them money uh, based on bad behavior in the past. Um, now that is fine if it's a one-off. Uh, the EU ETS for greenhouse gas emissions was introduced in the year 2005 and initially to reduce, to minimize opposition to this, 
permi uh, permits were grandfathered or grandparented and the promise was always oh, well, we're going to do this for three years only and then we're going to switch to auctioning right so starting in 2005 and now in 2024 and still a very large portion of emissions are of emission permits are grandparented right because there's still political opposition to the auctioning because <laughs> that means that the polluters have to give mo money to um, to the government and they don't don't like that right and they lobby hard uh, against this uh, of course if you reward permits for emissions in the past you're essentially rewarding bad behavior and if you do this repeatedly over a period of 20 years then you send completely the wrong signals <coughs> right in a sense we sound the more you emit the more goodies you will get right uh, so this is absolutely not the way it should be done but for political reasons uh, it has been done uh, the reason this is called grandfathering is twofold one you're giving away things for free and you're giving away things based on the past right and people thought this is what grandfathers do apparently people who don't have grandmothers and realize that their grandmother is exactly uh, like uh, their grandfather and maybe even worse so it should really be called grandparenting rather than grandfathering uh, um, <coughs> so taxes and tradable permits can be very similar provided that they're auctioned there's also a crucial difference between taxes and tradable permits uh, but we're going to do that after the break uh, so we're going to return at a few minutes past 11 okay we're <laughs> very well on schedule um so i talked about the equivalence of taxes and tradable permits um there's actually one key difference between the two uh, and that is that <coughs> when you impose a tax you do not know for certain the environmental effects unless you happen to know the cost curves of every polluter uh, in uh, your jurisdiction um, <coughs> that is you know that emissions are going to fall but you don't know by how much um, um, the opposite is true for tradable permits because you set this cap and if we abstract for the moment from illegal emissions you know what the emissions are going to be so the environmental effects are certain for tradable permits uh, of course unless you know where everybody's uh, cost curves are you do not know what the cost will be you can and that's actually the example that i showed with sulfur you may forecast the price wrong right and that is actually what happened uh, and what has happened in every example since uh, <coughs> so with tradable permits you know the environmental effect and you're guessing for the economic effects for taxes it's the other way, uh, other way around you know the chains at the margin of the costs because that is the tax that you imposed so you have a pretty good handle on the economic implications but of course you do not know how the market will respond and therefore you do not know the uh, environmental effects <coughs> um, so the question then becomes uh, well, the implication of what I just said is that if you know the future for certain and you know uh, what is how your market is behaving exactly, then taxes and tradable permits are equivalent. Uh, but the question, uh, uh, the more important question, is of course which of the two uncertainties, environmental uncertainty or economic uncertainty, is the more harmful? Uh, <coughs> And uh, to answer that question, we have to look at the Weizmann uh, theorem, named after Marty, uh, who you see uh, here. Um, so, how does this work? Uh, we're going to put. I'm going to put down the uh, benefit-cost diagram again. We have quantities of emissions on the um, 
quantity of emissions. On the horizontal axis, we have marginal costs, marginal benefits of price on the uh, vertical uh, axis. Um, if there's no emissions, then the margin of damages at the margin are pretty small. The higher the emissions, the more damage is done. Um, this is the unregulated amount of emissions that you would see. The further you have to push down your emissions, the more expensive it becomes at the margin, right? So the brown curve must slope this way, the green curve must slope uh, at that way. Uh, then the optimal quantity of emissions that you would like to see, this is the optimal amount of permits that you would like to issue, is Q prime, and then they would trade at, at price P, or alternatively, you can impose uh, the tax P star, and if you do that, you would get the quantity Q star, right? So this is the social optimum. <coughs> now let's assume that the industry <coughs> has convinced the government that reducing emissions is more expensive <coughs> than it really is. And the government assumes that the marginal costs are not this brown curve, it's not the true marginal cost, but it's really this red curve, the assumed uh, marginal costs. <coughs> now the implication then is that this is now the assumed social optimum. So my story that I just told you is wrong. If this would happen, then, oh no, the story that I told you is right. Sorry, and now I'm pressing two buttons at once. Um, the quantity that you would allow then is actually higher because you think it is more costly to reduce emissions at the margin than it really is. So you would allow higher uh, emission uh, emissions, you would lower emission reduction, and there is under-regulation if you go for tradable permits. So this is consistent with the story of lobbying uh, by uh, industrialists uh, that I told you. The corresponding price then is uh, P prime, which sort of undermines what I just told you. <laughs> because if the instrument is a price instrument, if there's a tax rather than tradable permits, then you would actually set the price higher than you should. That is, if you choose a price instrument, in this particular case, you go for over-regulation of the market, right? With quantities you go for under-regulation, with prices you go for over-regulation. Uh, so if you're an environmentalist and you have good reason to believe that the government will introduce a tax rather than go for tradable permits, then you should convince them that, margin, that it's really, really costly at the margin to reduce emissions, right? Because then you would see more stringent environmental uh, regulation. <coughs> so that is already one asymmetry between taxes and tradable permits. Uh, now let's look at the welfare loss of both the under-regulation with quantity instruments and the price, uh, the over-regulation with price instruments. Um, the welfare loss of under-regulation is the blue triangle here. So you go for a larger quantity of emissions, so you suffer additional environmental damage. That's the area under the green curve. This is the amount of additional environmental damage that you uh, suffer. But of course you have lower cost of regulation, and that's the area under the brown curve. That is this area here, and the difference between the two is a social loss of the blue triangle that you're looking at, right? <coughs> the welfare loss of the over-regulation with um, the price instrument with a tax is, well, you impose larger costs on the polluters, and that's the area under the brown curve, that's this thing here. But of course you have a greater environmental benefit, that's the area under the green curve, that is this area here, and the difference is the pink triangle that you're looking at. This is the Weizmann theorem, or the preliminaries of the Weizmann theorem. From where you're sitting, 
the blue triangle and the pink triangle look the same in size, right? They have the same area. That is not an optical illusion, they are the same size. So there is a redistribution going on from the environment to the polluters, or from the polluters to the environment, but the social, the net social uh, cost of overregulation and underregulation is the same. <coughs> Unless, that is, the marginal costs are steep, or the marginal uh, damages are steeper than the marginal costs. If the green curve um, becomes steeper, what happens is that the blue triangle shrinks and the pink triangle grows. Um, as you can clearly see, similarly, if the green curve becomes shallower, then the blue triangle grows and the pink triangle shrinks. And this is the Weizmann theorem, right? If the marginal cost curve and the marginal benefit curve are equally steep, then from a social perspective, it doesn't matter whether you underregulate with quantities or overregulate with taxes, with prices. But as soon as the two curves are of different steepness, it does matter. Right? And in words, uh, if the marginal damage cost curve is less steep than the marginal abatement cost curve, then mistakes with price instruments, taxes are less costly than our mistakes with quantity instruments that are tradable permits. And if the marginal damage cost curve is steeper than the marginal abatement cost curve, then mistakes with quantity instruments, tradable permits are less costly than our mistakes with price instruments. So, in true uh, economists' uh, tradition, Weizmann says it depends, right? But you can sort of also start making informed guesses in what circumstances it really matters, right? Um, so, what does a steep uh, marginal abatement cost, a uh, marginal damage cost curve mean? Essentially, means that a little bit of additional emissions makes for a lot of environmental a lot of additional environmental damage so then you're dealing with very toxic substances and if you allow more of them more uh, children will die right <clears throat> um, and if the thing you're looking at in order to avoid those toxic, the toxic substances, you would have uh, chains in the paint you use on toys or something, then it's pretty clear that your damage cost is very steep and you're talking about trivial costs and you switch to a slightly different paint, it's not going to break the bank, right? So in those cases, go for the environmental certainty, right? Because the costs are trivial, the benefits can be very large. Uh, <clears throat> if you have a problem like climatic change, then it's actually the other way around. Because if you have slightly more emissions in the year 2024 in the UK, Climate change is driven by the accumulation of greenhouse gases over the whole planet. And it's driven by the accumulation of uh, emissions over decades, if not centuries. So getting it slightly wrong with your emissions in the year 2024 or 2025 in a smallest country like the United Kingdom is not going to change the climate in any sort of substantive, measurable way. Whereas setting your targets too strict can cause real pain to households and companies. So in sort of a stock pollutant uh, that is cumulative over large areas uh, and over time, uh, 
then actually getting the quantity right is not that important because quantities do not really matter because the contribution is so tiny to a much bigger problem. Whereas the costs, if you get your target too strict, then actually you can cause real economic pain. So in those sort of circumstances, you should really go for price instruments for taxes rather than tradable permits because the economic certainty is much more valuable than the environmental certainty, right? <coughs> but in other cases, it's the other way around. So Weizmann is not just, doesn't just say it depends, but he also exactly specifies what it depends on, right? Um, <coughs> of course, Weizmann did not do this graphically, uh, and he did not even do it about the environment. Uh, <laughs> this was in the discussion about market-based economies versus central uh, planning. Uh, so very quickly uh, to uh, wrap up this, uh, <coughs> I introduced these criteria uh, last week. What I said was that cost effectiveness is an important criterion if you want to keep uh, the cost down. Taxes, taxes, tradable permits, subsidies, guarantee cost efficacy, uh, direct regulation uh, is very unlikely uh, to get there. Um, I talked about uh, administrative costs. Um, <coughs> it's actually a very mixed bag, right? Uh, command and control can be very cheap if you just issue a verdict and expect people to, uh, <coughs> to follow suit, but if you have to monitor and enforce your regulations, then it can become expensive. Uh, similarly, new taxes can be very expensive if you need to set up a new administrative apparatus, but if you can piggyback on VAT or uh, excises or income taxes or something like that, uh, it is actually uh, very uh, cheap. Uh, tradable permits require uh, monitoring and enforcement, but other than that, uh, not a whole lot. Monitoring and enforcement can actually be very expensive. It here says here that it's cheap. But recall that those monitoring units on power plants cost $124,000 per unit per year, right? Um, <coughs> environmental effectiveness, uh, we talked about big difference between taxes and tradable permits. Uh, direct regulation here has, yeah, you forbid things so they don't happen provided that enforcement uh, is there. Uh, we talked about dynamic effects. Uh, we did not talk much about flex. No, that's not true. We did talk about uh, flexibility uh, last week, um, <coughs> but I did not put it in the context of taxes and tradable permits. Uh, here, nothing is easy. Flexibility is important because we constantly learn new things. We discover new environmental problems. We discover that environmental problems are different than we thought they were. They may be more severe. They may be less severe. We constantly uh, discover new things. Uh, and we also constantly discover new ways of solving uh, environmental issues as well as discovering ways of polluting uh, the environment. Um, so circumstances con con continually change uh, and that means that your regulation has to follow that change. Um, <coughs> and some of these things are easy politically, lowering taxes is easy, raising taxes is hard. Um, Subsidies, it's the other way around. Uh, making environmental standards less strict is easy. Making them stricter is much more uh, difficult. Um, one key exception to this is tradable permits, where the government actually always has the option to release more permits than planned. And nobody will hate the government for doing, well, environmentalists would oppose this, but uh, the people directly affected, the industrialists would not. So that is easy. Um, but also if you think that you've released too many permits and you realize that the problem is more severe than you initially thought, then as a government, you can buy back those permits. It's gonna cost money, but you can strengthen the regulation by uh, buying back uh, permits. <coughs> and that is essentially what the European Commission has decided to do with CO2 uh, permits. Um, <coughs> another good thing about tradable permits is that you can intervene in the market. 
if you think there are too many permits for sulfur or for carbon dioxide or what have you, then anybody can go and buy these permits and then not use them. Right? You have the right to emit CO2, but it does not mean that you have a duty or an obligation to emit CO2. You can just buy the permit and not use it. And if you hold the permit, somebody else doesn't have it, and therefore they cannot emit emissions. So tradable permits have the advantage, unlike any other uh, instrument that we talked about, that the general public, if they can raise the money, can step in and make the uh, regulation more stringent. Now, theoretically this is true, it's also true that some people have bought permits and not used them, but uh, they have not been able to raise sufficient money to make a dent in the market, but theoretically it's definitely possible and at the margin it has happened. Uh, and the one thing I did not talk about uh, at uh, any great length are the distributional consequences. Um, and particularly the notion of cost effectiveness. What I did say is that environmental policy typically targets necessary goods such as energy and food uh, and therefore has typically negative uh, implications for the income distribution, that is poorer people are uh, hit harder by environmental leg legislation uh, than richer people. Now that is true regardless of how you intervene almost regardless of how you intervene. Tradable permits make energy and food more expensive, <laughs> taxes make uh, energy and food more expensive. Environmental standards, if you go in with regulation, then you make the product not more expensive in any direct way, but by imposing restrictions on the way it can be produced, you're also raising costs and presumably those costs are passed on to the customer. Uh, so with direct regulation, you also make necessary goods more expensive. Um, <coughs> um, now, there are two advantages of tradable permits and taxes over direct regulation also here. One is that if you use taxation or if you auction permits, then the government has revenue to offset the negative distributional effect. If you go with direct regulation, the government does not have that budget. So that is one key difference. Uh, the other uh, key difference is that with taxes, subsidies, tradable permits, you minimize the cost. And therefore you also minimize the negative distributional effects. If the overall cost is lower, then, and it is distributed in the same way, then you also reduce the burden on less wealthy households, right? <coughs> and that is an important thing to keep in mind here, that cost effectiveness, <coughs> that keeping the cost low is not just because you want to keep the overall cost low, <coughs> but you're also keeping the cost low for everybody, right? Including the people you may care most about. <coughs> Okay, that was it for this week, uh, but I'm gonna go into next week uh, because this is the lecture that we skipped and there's one chapter I want to do um, because it is, uh, I think, important that you realize this. And I'm gonna talk about market power and what it does to uh, environmental le uh, legis uh, regulation. <coughs> so this was initially planned for uh, the spring break. Um, <coughs> and this is um, a bit mathematical, um, but I think uh, the intuition will become uh, clear. So let's look at a very uh, simple uh, market. <coughs> we have a demand curve, we want the amount Q, uh, and that's the linear function of the price. Uh, pi is how much you uh, would get if you get it for free. Uh, assume this is food, at a certain point you're full and you don't want to eat more even if you don't have to pay for it, right? Um, so this is the demand uh, function, this is the uh, only parameter that is in there uh, and that of course implies an inverse uh, demand function. <laughs> P is pi minus Q. 
The uh, company that supplies Q has the following uh, profit uh, function. So this is its revenue, the price times the, the quantity. Uh, we assume that its cost of making Q are quadratic, half times Q squared, uh, and then it pays a tax on its production, uh, and that is tau times Q. Now, what does the company do? It maximizes its profits, uh, so d pi dq must equal zero, so we take p <coughs> times q, that's p, then uh, chain rule, q times delta p, uh, q times dp dq, right? But if we assume that this is a price taker, uh, this expression is zero. Um, this becomes minus Q, right, the marginal cost of production, uh, so it's 2 times 1 half minus Q, and this is again a linear expression, so minus tau, uh, and this must equal 0, so the supply function in this case is P, the selling price, minus D tax tau. <coughs> and if we then um, impose market uh, equilibrium, and uh, we follow Cunot and we said the supply, the quantity supplied is equal to the quantity demanded. Uh, so Q is Q, and uh, then we find Q is Q, then we find that this is the price, pi plus tau over 2, and this is the quantity, pi minus tau over 2. <coughs> right, so this is how a perfect market would work. Now let's look at uh, monopoly. <coughs> Demand function is the same as we had before. Profit uh, function is the same as we had before, but the first order condition for maximum profits is different. Uh, we still have P times Q dP dQ minus Q minus tau, but now this thing is not zero as it was before, but it is minus one, right? So a monopolist takes into account how changes in supply affects the price. A price taker, by definition, does not, right? Um, <coughs> so that means that the uh, supply function is pi p minus, not pi, but p minus tau over 2. Um, we set quantity equal to quantity or demand equal to supply and we find that the monopolist uh, behaves like this. This is the optimal amount that a monopolist puts on the market. If you compare the two, um, they look remarkably similar, pi minus tau, pi minus tau, uh, but a monopolist responds in a different way than a price taker. Here we divide by two, here we divide by three. Right? So we have a steeper uh, supply curve. <coughs> Right, so far so standard micro. Now, we need to move to the social planner, uh, but before we go there, we need to calculate the consumer surplus first. Um, so what is the consumer surplus? Well, it is how much you pay for your stuff, and that is a negative. So Q is the amount you get, P is what you pay for it. Uh, so this is the money out of pocket, right? So this is the negative. Um, and then it's the area under the demand curve. Demand curve was P pi minus Q, no, pi minus P's. Pi minus Q, sorry, it's the inverse one. Uh, <laughs> uh, and you do that from zero to the amount that you actually buy Q, and that is why we have the X here, that's the running variable. And uh, now you know why it's linear, right? So we have uh, this just carries over. If we integrate over a linear function, it becomes a quadratic function, right? Uh, and of course, you need to correct for the square that you put here by putting one over the square uh, here. That makes one half. And that, of course, you evaluate from zero to Q for X. Uh, fill that in. And what we get is this expression here, this is for the Q, this is for the zero, uh, work through it, replace uh, things and so on and so forth. 
uh, and this is your consumer surplus. Pi minus Q minus P, pi times Q minus P times Q minus one half times Q squared. That's your consumer surplus. Then your social welfare <coughs> consists of the consumer surplus plus the profit plus the tax revenue that the government gets, right? Uh, minus the environmental damage. This is the new element that is here. And the environmental damage, if you assume linear, it's delta Q. Um, <coughs> we stick the consumer surplus in here. This was the profit function that you looked at before. Uh, then we have to add the tax. So a tax is just a transfer payment from the companies to the government, right? So the companies pay this and the government receives this. So in the social welfare, we have the minus the tax revenue plus the tax revenue. Similarly, uh, households pay this amount for their consumption, but companies receive this amount. So from a social perspective, this is again a transfer payment and it drops out of social welfare because it's just money changing hands, right? Uh, so the social welfare function uh, is actually a lot simpler uh, than it at first looks because so many terms uh, cancel. It is pi minus delta times q minus q squared. <coughs> um, the decision that the social planner makes is what tax to impose. And that decision is driven by its first order condition, that is that the first partial derivative of the social welfare function to the tax tau, that's the decision that the government makes, uh, is equal to uh, zero. Now that looks a bit strange because our social welfare function, pi minus delta uh, times q minus q squared, does not depend on tau, right? At least not the way we have it. But in order to <coughs> find this, right, what you need to realize is that we actually del uh, derived the market equilibrium. The market clearing quantity in case of the price taker is Q prime, uh, which is equal to pi minus tau over two. So this Q here in the social welfare function should include the best response function of the market, right? This is, this Q prime is where the market clears. <coughs> so that needs to be included in there. So the social planner takes into account if it intervenes, how the market will respond, right? Uh, that is this Q uh, prime here. And then of course, um, W it does depend on tau, on the tax, right? So the W D tau uh, is, <coughs> uh, this is just a uh, linear expression, right? The tau doesn't matter. The tau here is just tau, so dt, d tau, d tau is 1, right? So we have minus 1 here. Um, and here we have the squared, but here we have 1 over uh, 2, so we have 2 over 2, so that's easy. Uh, and then we have this expression here, 2q uh, becomes uh, this thing here. Uh, this must equal 0. <coughs> um, so we divide by two, both cases, so we can just multiply everything by two, two times zero is zero, right? Uh, so what we have is that pi minus pi plus delta plus pi minus tau must equal zero, and what we have is that tau must equal delta. So what we have just done is rederive p goo, right? Delta is the environmental damage that is done at the margin. And what we find is that the optimal tax that we should set is equal to the marginal environmental damage. So we have just rederived the Pigou tax. Not, however, <coughs> um, if we have a monopolist. The social welfare function is the same in the case of the price taker, uh, the perfect market, and uh, the monopoly, 
but the response function of the market is different. Whereas previously we had pi minus tau over 2, now we have pi minus tau over 3. And that is the way the market responds to any regulation imposed by, uh, any tax imposed by the social planner. Uh, I pressed the wrong button there. Um, <coughs> so the W, the tau, now instead of twos we have threes, right, uh, under. Uh, so it all becomes a little bit uh, more complicated, but if you uh, work it through, then what you find is that the optimal tax is one and a half times the marginal environmental damage minus one half times the quantity that you would use if the price were zero, the satiation point. So in a perfect market, the optimal tax that you would impose is the Pigou tax. In a market with market power, the optimal tax that you would impose is something very different. Um, there we go. Uh, in the perfect market, the tax that you would impose is tau, uh, tau is equal to delta. Here we put in two additional corrections. A, we multiply the Pigou tax by one and a half, and the one and a half comes out of the different response of a monopolist versus a price taker to a change in prices. The price taker doesn't care about the tax, just passes it on, but a monopolist changes behavior as soon as you start taxing. That is the key difference here. <coughs> uh, and they respond uh, differently. Uh, but then you also correct for uh, the market power. <coughs> so let's do this graphically. Uh, and there's a lot of things going on on this graph. Um, so this is the demand curve, right? Uh, this is your pi uh, that we had. The greater the price, the less you buy, right? Uh, price is on this axis, quantity is on this axis. So that is uh, simple enough. And then here we have the supply curve, unregulated, and the point that you find is this one here. Then you say, but there is environmental damage that is being done. So we want to correct for that, we want to uh, impose a tax. Uh, and that means that your supply curve shifts uh, upwards, um, or maybe it shifts, um, well, and depending on how you look at it, uh, let's assume that it shifts for you guys uh, to the left, <coughs> for me as well, because I just had to turn around, right, that was a bit silly, um, and as a result, the optimal quantity, or the quantity that you would buy is less, right, because the price has gone up, because now there is a tax as well as the production cost that need to be taken into account. So that is fairly straightforward, right? And this is uh, essentially a mirror image of what we looked at uh, before. <coughs> now, with a monopoly, three things change, right? So the first thing is that the um, monopolistic uh, supply function in red, <coughs> that was a lot of uh, buttons I pressed, uh, is steeper than the price taker's supply function. Because they take into account what a monopolist takes into account, what a change in their supply does to the price, right? So you would see a stronger response and this curve is steeper. So that is the first uh, thing that changes. <coughs> Then when you impose this environmental tax that for reasons that are a bit beyond me uh, has changed from delta to phi, um, then that shifts, uh, oh wait, so, sorry, uh, <coughs> completely wrong. It's this curve uh, that I was pointing at, not this one, uh, which is also steeper. Um, <coughs> this is what a mo monopolist would do in an unregulated market, right? 
would reduce supply in order to increase the price right so instead of having this quantity uh, the monopolist would supply this quantity <coughs> now if you impose an environmental tax that has changed the name from delta to phi um, production would follow further um, but because the curve is steeper it would fall by a so in a perfect market quantity would fall from here to here in a monopolistic market quantity would fall from here to here and that's a smaller distance because the supply curve is steeper so in order to get a monopolist to cut its emissions by the same amount you need to impose a higher tax and for the parameters that I've chosen that is exactly one and a half times as high right that is just follows from the numbers I stuck in but in general because the supply curve of a monopolist is always steeper than the supply curve of a, a price taker you have to work harder to get the same effect right <coughs> So that is the first thing. And then the second thing that is going on is that we are sort of in a suboptimal world. We have a monopolist and therefore we have a problem with market power, but we don't have an instrument against market power. And what we're doing is we're solving two problems at once. We're solving the environmental problem and we're solving the market power problem and we do both by a tax on production now that is a problem right because a monopolist undersupplies relative to the social optimum so if a tax a fiscal instrument is the only thing we have there is no way of breaking up the monopoly what you would need to do in order to supply the optimal uh, amount is that you start subsidizing the monopolist to supply more right um, <coughs> so that is this movement here this is the unregulated uh, monopolist who supplies this amount and this is the social optimum or this is the optimum if there were no environmental problems so we want to push the monopolist from this point to this point and this is the subsidy that we then impose right and then the optimal regulation is a mix of trying to get the monopolist to supply more to correct for market power and trying to get the monopolist to supply less because of the environmental pollution right <coughs> and therefore we end up with this awkward combined subsidy that is you work harder on the environmental part but at the same time you give a subsidy to correct for market power and then it just depends on which of the two is worse whether you subsidize a monopolist or tax them on net right one pushes in one direction the other pushes in the other direction <coughs> um, <coughs> so the moral of this story is that in a perfect market <coughs> The tax that you want to impose on pollution is the Pigou tax. In an imperfect market, if there's market power, you need to work harder than the Pigou tax because the supply curve is steeper. But then if you're in the situation that this, is, that this fiscal instrument is the only thing you have, you also may want to correct market power at the same time and then it actually becomes ambiguous whether you want to work harder or less hard. And even, as I showed in this example, there may even a subsidy uh, come up, right? Now, <coughs> this um, works relatively uh, easily if you have a monopolist versus a price taker so you have a perfect market versus the most imperfect market than we can uh, imagine um, 
it's actually very rarely the case that we have uh, a true monopoly. Um, but what we see in many markets are other forms of market power, all sorts of types of oligopolies, uh, and sometimes oligopsonies even. Um, <coughs> now, I could bore you uh, by taking you through the maths if we have a duopoly and if we have a triopoly and so on and so forth, and it's a Cournot equilibrium or it's a, a Bernard equilibrium and so on and so forth. The mathematics just gets more and more complicated the insights don't change, right? And the fundamental insight here is that this stuff about Pigou is wonderful if you have a market with a single imperfection. As soon as you introduce additional imperfection in the markets, the optimal tax is not a Pigou tax, and you actually have to correct for those market imperfections. <coughs> um, so, I'll uh, spare you that. Uh, we're uh, running out of time, so I'll also spare you if you read uh, the textbook, uh, either of the two, uh, then you see that there's lots of variants on this, and you can work through them. Uh, if you're interested, uh, they're not on the exam, um, <coughs> but they are very uh, interesting. Uh, the other thing, um, and uh, <coughs> another market imperfection that is there is if you have pre-existing tax distortions that also messes up your Pigou tax. Uh, the other things that we won't have time to go into are what happens if there's information asymmetry between the regulator and the regulated and therefore you have adverse selection uh, and also what if enforcement is not uh, perfect or compliance is not perfect. That's also in the book but we won't have time to go to that in the, um, in the lectures and it is not on the exam, but it is very interesting economics. So I'll we'll leave it uh, to that. We now have a free, way, free week break, right? Uh, and I wish you all a blessed Easter.